so you had your your own uh, homebrew store working yep. a second job yep. a kid yep and then at, at what point did you then think what I really need to do to make things even easier for myself is to start a brewery. <laughs> this is Beer Geek Bucket List. Martin's drinking by himself. Yeah, it's, it's, that happens all the time, so fine. 20 years ago, I tasted a beer that completely changed my life. That beer was Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Ken Grossman, was the visionary founder of a brewery which was instrumental in the formation and revolution of craft beer around the world. To this day, I have lived by the mantra, when I grow up, I want to be Ken Grossman. Cheers. Cheers. So from the age of 13 to 17 in the UK, I drank Tenant's Lager and I thought that's what beer was. Then in, when I was 17 years old, there was two beers that changed my life forever. One was Cantillon Rose de Gambrinas, mm -hmm. and the other one was Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. And where were you drinking that, in the UK or over when you'd visit the US? It was in the, in the UK. In the UK? I'd only ever been to the US uh, once by the time I was 17. And I was 10 the first time I was here. And I think if my parents had allowed me to have a beer when I was 10, I would have well, they would have been locked up. I would have been fine. <laughs> it's an absolute privilege to be here today in, uh, in the brewery here in Chico. I would like to start with just understanding a little bit about uh, how you came into beer in the first place. Actually, uh, it was when I was quite young and, and uh, I, I guess my parents could have been locked up as well if they, uh, if they were aware of what I was doing. But um, so I had a, a neighbor who lived uh, just a few doors down and his son and I went to elementary school together. And so from a pretty early age, I'd go visit my buddy and his dad was always doing something uh, with fermentation. So he was a serious home brewer uh, and back in that era, so that was back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, you know, home brewing was really not um, something that was very common or popular and certainly not um, quality focused. Yeah. So the, the home brewers were trying to make maybe a cheap batch of beer, high alcohol, lots of sugar, um, and not necessarily um, were they perfecting the art of brewing. But, but this guy, uh, Cal was his name, he was a, a serious amateur brewer and winemaker, uh, distiller. He was into everything fermentation, even made sake, I remember when I was a kid. Uh -huh. And so I was exposed to boiling wort and fermenting beer from a really early age. And, I guess uh, just the whole romance of, of the alchemy of, of brewing got into my system. And so when I was a teenager, I started to uh, play around a little bit and brewed a little bit of beer in my closet and then mm -hmm. uh, hit it later in a little uh, building I had in back and, and actually started um, brewing around 1969. 1969. And, yeah. And, um, and back then, you know, the, the brewing information came out of the UK. so the. The books that I read were, um, um, you know, British brewing books and about how to make British style beers. And um, then uh, a, a treatise of lager brewing came out by Fred Eckhart, and I read that, and then started really to expand my my brewing hobby. I moved to Chico in 1972 and took my home brewing kit with me. And uh, within a couple of years, I decided uh, I wanted to be more serious about it. I was studying chemistry in college, so I had a, a science background. Okay. And I opened up a homebrew supply store in 1976, and uh, that allowed me to really perfect my brewing and import a lot of great ingredients. And so I was bringing malts and hops from Europe over and going up to Yakima. I did that my, my very first year of the homebrew shop. Uh, yeah. Made a pilgrimage and bought all the different varieties of American hops I could get. And then after homebrew shop for a couple of years, I said, I, I think I want to be a commercial brewery. And New Albion had opened up in, um, uh, Sonoma, and I went down and visited Jack McAuliffe and visited Fritz Maytag in San Francisco. Um, so that was all in the mid 70s. And then put my homebrew shop up for sale, wrote a business plan in 1977, 1978, we incorporated. So um, started started brewing beer commercially uh, in 1980. And, and what was the beer scene like back when you, uh, when you were homebrewing and when you had the, the homebrew, homebrew store before you started the brewery? You know, the beer scene in America was pretty dismal. The, um, the, the range of beers really, if you wanted to sample uh, a range of beers, they came from Europe. There were you know, basically one style of beer being brewed by 
just about all the breweries, and that was American Light Lager. Mm -hmm. There were a couple exceptions, but uh, Rainier Ale uh, up out of uh, uh, Seattle, Rainier uh, Ale was probably an anomaly. Uh, high alcohol, it was really a malt liquor, I think, more than, um, than a real a tough fermented ale. Uh, but it had a little bit of character and flavor, and then Ballantine's India Pale Ale was around uh, back. Uh, very limited distribution. But mm -hmm. besides that, it was really 95% light lager beers. Um, so the scene was pretty dismal if you wanted to, to, to be a beer drinker, unless you went and just bought a range of imported beers. And were there any beers that influenced you in those early days? You know, certainly, uh, you know, what Fritz Maytag had done at Anchor Steam and, and what Jack McAuliffe had done. But a, as a serious home brewer myself, I was brewing just the whole range of beers. And, and we were serious enough that we had our own yeast collection. So we had a, we had a variety of, of yeasts in our, uh, in our own collection. And I was able to, say, bring in a lot of imported ingredients. So I was bringing in malt and hops from Europe. And so I brewed pretty much everything. Um, matter of fact, the, the first batch of beer that we brewed uh, um, when I opened the brewery in 1980 was a stout, and I had been brewing stouts at home for many, many years, and, um, and strong ales and um, IPA styles. Actually, one of our early recipes that we didn't go with, we actually called an IPA, and, and it was uh, uh, ended up being more like our celebration ale, which came out with an 81. Uh, but it was very, very limited, and um, you know, homebrewing was illegal uh, at at that point in time. Uh, didn't become legal for a few years after that, huh. Al although nobody was ever arrested for it. Um, after prohibition, home winemaking got legalized, but for some reason, home brewing sort of uh, was never addressed. Back then, in the late seventies, was that a viable business to have a homebrew store in uh, in Chico? No, um, I, uh, I actually had to work a second job. Um, so my wife and I, I had a, a partner for a little bit when I first opened the shop, was a neighbor of mine. Mm -hmm. And then he decided it wasn't for him. And so I bought him out and then my wife and I ran the shop and I had a second job. So I, I worked in a bicycle repair shop um, as a mechanic uh, most of the, the week and uh, to, to pay the bills and then my wife was was in the homebrew shop and then we had a baby and uh, okay. my daughter Sierra was born and so she was actually in a bassinet in the homebrew shop for uh, the first uh, six months of her life as, as we were uh, trying to make ends meet. But no, it was not a viable business. I mean, a, a good day was $50 and that was retail sales, that wasn't profit. Yeah. So, and how I mean, old were you at that, at that point? Uh, 22. 22, yeah. so you had your, your own uh, homebrew store, working yeah. a second job, yeah. a kid, Yep. And then at, at what point did you then think, what I really need to do to make things even easier for myself is to start, <laughs> is to start a brewery? I, I seriously debated, do I go with a bike shop where I know I can make a living or do I open a brewery where I know I'll be challenged and uh, it'll be something that I'm a lot more passionate about. And so I consciously passed on the bike shop and decided to go all in on the brewery, um, hoping that uh, you know it would be uh, something I could make a living at eventually, and, and our, our business plan was quite meager. Um, it called for us uh, being able to brew 2,500 barrels of beer a year uh, mm -hmm. in, in a 10 barrel brew house that I built myself. Um, and then if possible, mm -hmm. if there was a market for it, we could expand to 3,500 barrels a year. Yeah, so you've got a business plan that says you can, if you make that much beer, it, 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 it makes sense. Yeah. But that's a business plan and, and not reality. Correct. So, so how, how did the... Uh... Reality was harsh, <laughs> um, the, the business plan, besides the fact that we spent all the money we uh, had raised uh, numerous times and had to go back and go find more people to give us money. We ran out of money repeatedly before we got the doors open. So we, we were struggling even just to make our first batch of beer. Uh, took a long time to, to build all the equipment, so I welded it, I did all the plumbing myself, I did all the electrical myself, I did the refrigeration. So just getting the doors open was, was a challenge, and then as soon as we started making beer, we realized that there's a lot more expenses than we had anticipated, and so we, we pretty quickly decided we, we better expand or we're gonna die. And uh, the breweries at that time, there were six of us that opened up between 1978 and 1982. We're the last man standing as far as that original uh, group of six brewers. What does that look like in a, in a country which is, which is light lager? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what you were producing definitely you know, wasn't light lager. How, how, how do you convince uh, someone who's never tasted a beer like that before that that's the way forward? It was tough. I mean, the, the first few years, uh, not only did we have to convince the consumer, which we certainly did, and it was beer festivals and it was uh, 
uh, fine restaurants. We actually um, got our beer on at Chez Panisse, which was a very progressive restaurant in Berkeley. And uh, that was one of our first on-premise accounts. And she was looking for unique, uh, you know, local uh, American crafted uh, products and, and farm to table. It was very early on in the farm to table movement. Uh, so she put our beer on tap. And then that was uh, really a, a good thing to show the the consumer that uh, you know American beer can be very high end mm -hmm. because back in that day it was light lager and and most American beers weren't very respected but it was you know one consumer at a time it was lots of uh, walking the streets sampling beers um, and we would uh, you know have to convince the the retailer to put the beer on the shelf yep. and we also had to convince the wholesaler to even you know inventory the beer in their their warehouse. So when we first started uh, in Chico, we only distributed here and we did it all by ourselves. So we didn't have a, a middleman there. So it was you know, me or one of our, uh, one, our one employee going into the, um, to the store or the restaurant or the bar and you know, trying to convince the, the owner of the retail establishment to put our beer on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And then after we expanded out of Chico, then we had to go through distributors and then it was convincing the distributor to stock the beer and the retailer and then the consumer to, to buy it. So it was um, really slow and, and hard fought wins. Uh, yeah. I remember you know, a, a whole day of selling and you might get one, uh, one account to, to put your beer on and they'd take one case. Yep. Um, so it, it was tough. And that was pale ale? Uh, so we started out with pale ale. Yep, pale ale was our, our flagship and our, our, our first to go to market. Um, we also had a stout and a porter. Um, so back in that era, um, you know, stouts and porters and ales were all very foreign uh, beers for most American beer drinkers. But they were sort of the traditional styles that were brewed turn of the century. Uh, we, we found some old brewing books and they would show, you know, so-and-so's brewery, ales, porters, and stouts would be on their, their signpost. Yeah. And so we sort of thought, well, if we're hearkening back to that era, we'll produce an ale, a porter, and a stout. And how did the... I guess the recipe development of, of pale ale go together and you know how did it go from a concept through to a finished beer? So actually I've, I've got all those old uh, records so um, I'm a bit of a pack rat so I did save uh, a lot of my early uh, homebrew recipes and so we've got uh, uh, pale ale batch number one, pale ale batch number two, pale ale batch number three. I've got a dozen of those that we were brewing as homebrewers. Uh, so as we were building the brewery every week we brew a batch of beer um, to try to hone in our recipe. And so we were experimenting with uh, different yeast strains, with uh, different hop varieties, and, and we wanted to use American hops. We wanted this to be an American mm -hmm. pale ale. Um, and so we were honing in on the yeast strain and on the fermentation temperature and on the hop uh, bill and on the, you know, the malt uh, balance, you know, welding for fermenters and all the other things I was doing, we would find time to brew a batch of beer every week. Yep. And um, so after we got it, perfected on a homebrew level than when we started brewing commercially. Uh, we struggled to, you know, uh, just the recipe as we scaled up. And so that took another 10 batches or 12 batches of pale ale brewing that we brewed and dumped before we actually found the one that was the match of what we wanted to go to market with. So it, it uh, took us a while to, to refine it. But once we got the recipe, we've stuck with it all these years. And what, what were the early days like in terms of getting hold of ingredients? If you're a very small brewery, quite often it's very difficult yeah. to, to get hold of ingredients. It, it was really difficult back then because the supply chain was not set up to deal with small customers. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at a, a normal maltster, they're you know, rail cars of, of malt rather than uh, truckloads. I used to drive my uh, flatbed uh, 57 Chevy truck down to the maltster um, with a bin on the back, and I would pull under this big chute that was uh, designed to fill a rail car. And he would open it for just a second, and it would dump all this malt in, and then I would tarp it and drive back to Chico, and that would last me about a month. Um, and then as far as hops go, um, I had family near Yakima, so actually I started going uh, to visit the hop growers back okay. when I had my homebrew shop. I'd go up every year. And so I started to develop connections with the hop industry uh, really quite early. And, mm -hmm. and so uh, initially I would drive up to Yakima and go load my car up and drive it back, and then eventually uh, you know, we would get a bale or two sent down. Um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't too hard. There just weren't a lot of options. And in terms of putting the brewery together, you know, what, what did that originally uh, original brewery look like? Um, we actually have it here. Um, it's, it's out in the back lot. It was pretty uh, primitive. It was cobbled together. The 
Um, the louder ton or mash ton was um, an old cheese vat that I'd picked up at a scrapyard and I okay. made, a made a false bottom for it. Used a canoe paddle, so it was all manual. There were no, no automation. Um, the brew kettle was some old big steam, used steam kettle I'd picked up that I converted to direct fire burners uh, out of a scrapyard. And um, the burners came out of some old bottle washer that I bolted the burners under the kettle. And uh, Whirlpool, I actually made myself. I welded the um, stainless together and uh, I was a welder as well. Okay. Um, so quite primitive and crude. So you, you actually made the I made majority of, of the of the original brewery. Yep, I built the mill from scratch myself. I, uh, I bought a pipe, a big well casing, like eight or 10 inch well casing and welded ends on them and chucked it up on a lathe and turned them smooth and then built, welded the whole frame together. And yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of work. And how, how well did it work? You know, the, uh, the first mill I built, um, I built a few of them. The first mill did not work well. I, I actually built it out of wood and um, I was sort of following what Jack McAuliffe had done and the thing shook and rattled so bad that uh, I ended up scrapping that idea and then uh, I, I welded one up and it worked uh, well enough. Um, I actually sold it to another brewer after a couple of years and, and I'm not sure what they're, what they're doing with it, if they still have it. Uh, it'd be a, a good museum relic now. But I ended up after a couple of years finding a, a mill uh, that was built uh, I think in 1906, and uh, changed my mill out for this one that was uh, heavier duty, but certainly primitive. Uh, but my bottling line was an old soda filler it, that I had picked up um, at a, a closed down uh, soda works up in Washington State. And I converted it to fill beer, not very well, um, but it, it got us started. And then when Fritz Maytag at Anchor expanded their brewery, um, they put a, a new bottling line in and I got their old bottle filler. So that was my first true uh, beer bottle filler, mm -hmm. although it still wasn't a great model. It was built, uh, I think, in the late 40s or early 50s. Um, but it, it got us uh, going for a number of years and, and uh, did a decent job filling. Everything in the original brewery was, was, was pretty, either, either completely redone by you or mm -hmm. built from scratch yep. by you. Yep. What were those first five years like as a as a brewery? I know for for us in, in Scotland, I mean, even like, like you said, even selling one case of beer in a day is sometimes a, a huge win. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what, what did year one through to year five look like? Uh, year one was touch and go, um, really, whether or not we would, would make, um, you know, make it. Um, I, I kept the job at the bike shop, so even though I was brewing every day, uh, and even when I was building, I, one day a week I worked at the bike shop just to pay bills because the first year at the brewery we didn't take any salary home. Yeah. And I had a, a wife and, and one child at the time and a, a, another one soon to come, and um, so I had to have some income. So I kept, uh, I kept working uh, seven days a week um, in a brewery six and then a bike shop on the weekends. Um, so that was rough. And then, um, you know, as we uh, eventually figured out how to make beer consistently, uh, and we were actually going into market because I said we dumped the first 10 batches. So uh, that was a, a real um, challenge that we didn't have any money, yeah. but we knew we didn't want to sell beer that we couldn't reproduce batch after batch. And, and so- What was the reason for the first 10 batches? Being um, just um, not flavor match. Most of it had to do with fermentation, actually. Okay. Uh, we couldn't get, uh, uh, quick, healthy fermentations, uh, batch after batch, and as it turned out, we weren't giving our yeast enough oxygen during the uh, fermentation start, and so we weren't uh, growing enough healthy new yeast cells for the subsequent brews. And so once we figured out we needed more uh, wort aeration uh, for our yeast strain, um, then our fermentation smoothed right out and the beers were very consistent batch to batch. But okay. um, it took a couple of months, and um, so we had no money and we were um, not going to sell beer we weren't happy with, but that was real, real rough, just emotionally. And, and uh, once we finally figured it out, we were off and running. But then it was a slow build. Uh, our first, uh, you know, first year, I think we produced um, 800 barrels or something. Um, and then our second year, we started to get some traction, and we started to take home a couple hundred, 200 dollars a month was what our pay went from zero to 200. Mm -hmm. And at least on that, I could eat. And, yeah, pay, pay a little bit of rent and have then, some uh, diapers for the yeah. for the kids. And then eventually, uh, you know, we were able to um, hire an employee. We had one part-time employee to start, but uh, like packaging day, we would bring in all of our friends and um, you know, 
it was we give them beer for beer for packaging and mm -hmm. um, minimum wage and um, so it, it was challenging year five by year five we were starting to uh, realize that we had a real business and that um, you know we needed to figure out how to grow it just because the uh, you know the the business plan really was not uh, very realistic and when we you know, just started to realize that you know we needed cash flow in order to yep. expand and to pay people and um, you know things cost more than you anticipate and you know all, all that stuff that goes into running a business that you don't think about mm -hmm. and the brewery is called Sierra Nevada is that named after your daughter no, it's named after my daughter and uh, the brewery is named after the mountain range, which is just right behind us. So um, I was actually uh, uh, quite a bit of an uh, outdoorsman when I was uh, a teenager. And, okay. and actually the neighbor who was the serious home brewer, he was uh, a, a mountaineer and an instructor. And uh, he led a lot of uh, trips and hikes. And so as kids, we would go up into the Sierra Nevadas with him and backpack and uh, climb mountains and, and uh, so I, I had a love of the Sierras from a, an early age and then when we moved up to the mountains, uh, up to Chico, my wife and I would go in the mountains all the time and so mm. we both had a love of the Sierra Nevadas and liked the name Sierra. Combining your two big passions, mm. outdoors and, and beer. Yep. That's awesome. So you said the stout was the first beer you ever brewed on your yeah, system. Yeah, so batch one we figured let's brew a stout because uh, with all the malts and, and strong flavors that'll cover up any minor problems we might have. So, uh, and we didn't intend to sell it, um, but we brewed, uh, yeah, batch one was five barrels of stout. And you still make that beer? Uh, we still make that beer. Should we try it? Uh, I think we should. Thank you. Well, cheers. So this is uh, uh, a stout that we've been brewing for close, close to 40 years now. It's really good. And like the thing that's so crazy for me is that, you know, sitting here drinking these beers with you, these are beers that you, you know, made up uh, almost 40 years ago now, but they're actually the, I guess, style guidelines that people think for the majority of, of craft beer, whether it's a pale ale, whether mm -hmm. it's, a, you know, an American stout or um, a porter. So, you know, this really is a, a huge piece of craft brewing history. In terms of your recipe development, you know, how did you come up with the recipe for the stout? You know, the thing that always gets me with, with your beer is is the balance and the drinkability of it. So you know, whether it's the, the pale ale, which you know it's reasonably high bitterness, and you know, in its day, it's probably off the charts bitterness mm -hmm. of what mid thirties, uh, high thirties, high thirties yeah. IBU. Yeah. Um, but then you've got that beautiful uh, hop aroma, which is balanced mm -hmm. with the with the body, which has got a little bit of uh, what crystal malt mm -hmm. in there as well. Yep. And so you have something that for its time would have been super, super bitter, mm -hmm. but then you balanced it nicely with the malt sweetness. Um, and it's, you know, the same with, with this stout as well. You know, it's, it's a, a, a very nice uh, chocolate there, there's dark fruit, but again, it's a beer that you can drink, um, well, at the moment by the half pint, I'm sure you can buy the pint too. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that we, we felt strongly about is, you know, as we were formulating recipes, we can be intense, but let's make sure we're in balance. Mm. And so our Celebration Ale, which we produced, um, it was a very early IPA, so that was in 1981. Uh, I remember producing about 90 cases of it, and I personally picked out the, you know, all the hops, and it was one lot that I thought was really unique uh, aroma-wise, and they were, it was a baby field of Cascades. Okay. But I remember them being, you know, so sort of small cones, but I remember them being just intensely aromatic. And I was like, okay, these are going in our, our dry hopped uh, celebration ale. Um, and again, very hoppy, very aromatic, um, but a good malt backbone to balance it. So it wasn't considered extreme, uh, but I think it was considered strong and, and but well balanced. Mm. And as the craft beer, in the, did you call it the craft beer industry back then? Or no. Or craft beer, what, what, what did you No, craft beer wasn't a term. So uh, we got coined micro, um, so microbrewery pretty early on. And I remember Fritz Maytag not liking being called a microbrewer because he uh, connected it with microcomputers. And, and back then, that's what computers were, were called. So as uh, you know, Apple and, and the other computers were being developed, they were micro and rather than the, you know, the big, huge room full of of IBM computers, that was the norm, and yep. um, so he didn't like the connection to the to the micro computer industry, and so uh, I don't know if, if he helped push the the craft, but uh, 
I think uh, as things evolved, um, you know, we were referred to as craft brewers. When did you move to what is now the, the place that we're sitting? Um, so, you know, a little bit of a, a, a history. So in, in um, the early 80s at the old brewery, I think 80, end of 82, um, we started to realize that our primitive little tin barrel brew house maybe wasn't going to be what we needed long term. And we got some publicity, I think it was uh, beginning of 83, uh, in the San Francisco Chronicle. There was a big article written up, um, uh, excuse me, San, San Francisco Examiner, a big article written up about us. Mm -hmm. And um, right about the same time, there was a, a beer buyer for one of the large grocery store chains whose daughter went to Chico State. And so he would come visit his daughter, he'd stop by the brewery and he'd drink beer with us. And he thought, this is so cool, this little teeny brewery making these great beers. And so he started to advertise uh, in the uh, weekly um, grocery store circular uh, Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. And yep. we had nothing to do with it. We didn't even know the ads were coming out. And there'd be an ad for Pale Ale. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, orders would spike and we couldn't make enough. And so that started happening uh, pretty early on in the 80s. So I went to Germany um, in 83 and bought this brew house right behind us. In 83? Yep. Yeah. So just, yeah. just three years after you started? Yep. Uh, and we mortgaged everything. We, didn't, we didn't, didn't have the money, but we you know, figured uh, we bought that for about um, 20,000 pounds, uh, $15,000 mm -hmm. we bought the copper brew house. And uh, so cheap enough, but by the time we you know, took it out of the building and crated it and chipped it, we, we had a bit more in, into it than that. So we got it to Chico, yeah, in, in uh, I think sometime in 83, and um, wrote a new business plan and tried to borrow money. and no one will loan us a penny. And we went to uh, you know, banks and friends and everybody was like, yeah, it's pretty risky. I mean, you guys, yeah, you're, you're growing, but you're not making any money. You're not really any real money. And you want to borrow a million dollars. That's what we figured it would take to, dollars, yeah, yeah, figured what it would take to build a whole new brewery. Yep. And um, so the equipment ended up sitting in crates for years. And so it sat there until 87, 88, when we installed and started building here and, and finally installed and commissioned it. So um, we uh, just needed to make more, more and more beer out of that little brew house. So yep. I expanded the 10 barrels, uh, added some capacity to the kettle so I could get up to 15, 16 barrel batches. Mm -hmm. uh, we started brewing around the clock. We started um, you know, taking over some other little metal buildings in our, in our little uh, complex. Um, got a new warehouse, added a couple employees, and we eventually made about 12,000 barrels at, the, uh, at that original brewery. And I designed it for a maximum of really 3,500. Um, so we were just running around the clock. And finally, we were able to convince people to loan us money. So I got a, a small business loan, and then I talked to somebody else into loaning us the money to start the construction here. Um, and so that, that was really in 88 we moved here. 88. Yeah. And so during that time of, of running the brewery flat out and trying to build a new brewery at the same time, what, what was your involvement? In, is that everything or brewing or, or where did you sit at that so, point? So, so uh, actually the building right across the street where we're sitting, uh, I rented while we were starting to build here. And I started moving all the equipment over there and building it again. We had to build quite a bit of stuff. So we built all the bottling line conveyors ourselves. We had to rebuild all this this copper equipment, uh, you know, been in storage for years, yeah. and so it needed, uh, you know, overhauled and gearboxes and bearings and all and that kind of stuff. It's German, right? So yeah, probably so everything's metric and not everything's metric, and all all the power was, you know, 50 hertz rather than 60 hertz, <laughs> and uh, so we had to rewire motors and and you know, the, today you could use frequency converters, but back then that wasn't a common thing to do. Um, and so, yeah, it took us another year and a half to build this place. And I spent most of my time over here managing the um, building and rebuilding of equipment and the construction side. So um, I, I didn't do the day-to-day -day brewing. Um, I hadn't done that in a couple years. I started, I, I did all the brewing. So mm -hmm. I, I, I brewed every batch and I bottled every batch. I ran the bottling line two days a week and brewed three days a week. And as we moved over here, you know, I, was, I was in the construction mode. Yeah. <laughs> And, and you said you built the the conveyors for the yeah, all bottom. from scratch. Yeah, we we uh, basically um, bent the metal and welded them together and um, put 
UHMW um, strips on them, and we did all that stuff. You know, it was it was uh, a long, drawn out process. And how big was the brewery uh, in 1988? The, the, the new facility here. So um, I guess you have to sort of picture that era. So uh, Anchor Steam was the most successful um, small craft brewer, and then they had a long history. I mean, it was an old company that mm -hmm. Fritz had bought, and they were at about I think fifty or sixty thousand barrels, maybe not even maybe forty or fifty thousand barrels okay. back in in the time when I was designing this. Yep. So um, I was thinking, God, if we could ever grow to to that large, mm -hmm. uh, that would be just amazing. So I designed this brewery to max out at 60,000 barrels. Right. And we were at you know about 10 or 12,000 when I was in the design phases. And so I thought four times growth would be um, enormous. It's ambitious. Yeah, very ambitious. And so, uh, and we only had enough money to buy uh, less than two acres of ground mm -hmm. uh, here. So this was a small parcel when we bought it. And the building was designed, it, it fit pretty much uh, front to back, side to side on the parcel we were at. So we were like landlocked. Wow. Um, but thankfully there was vacant land around us, we just couldn't afford to buy it. Mm -hmm. So eventually we were able to, to acquire more land. But initially it was like, okay, this is it, 60,000 barrel maximum. We'll get it all on this this uh, footprint. Uh, brewed 20,000 the first year, the next year was over 30, the next year was like 42 or something. Uh, and the next year we were at 60. And so uh, it didn't take very long for us to uh, to grow, and that was an era when it was like, I won't say it's e it was easy to grow, but uh, you know, we were expanding ge geographically, so we started in California, but then we you know, would find marketplaces that were, uh, I guess, more progressive and receptive to mm -hmm. craft beer, so Portland, Seattle, Denver, uh, Boulder. And, and as you're growing uh, yeah. during that period, so what, what was the year where you'd maxed out um, the initial site here? So we started to add vessels to this brew house. So we we added uh, we added a whirlpool initially, but we added a, a, a mash mixer and uh, a few other things that allowed us to get up to almost eight brews a day uh, here. So we actually got up to just under three hundred thousand barrels in um, yeah in uh, ninety seven. Mm -hmm. So in about ten years, um, and then we built the big expansion next door, the two hundred barrel brew house. What, what were some of the main um, challenges during that that period? You know, when you're in that uh, heavy of a growth mode, um, everything's a challenge. I mean, you're, you're constantly uh, needing to fix some bottleneck in the operation. So, uh, you know, you add more brewing capacity, well, then you got to add more fermenter capacity. You add more fermenter capacity, you need more cooling capacity. You add more cooling capacity, now you need more bottling capacity. And so, you, you know, pretty much going around every um, aspect of making beer and upgrading it, um, you know, year after year. Um, you know, we didn't have the resources or the, I guess, the, the, the forethought to build, you know, this system this big so it could grow to 300,000 barrels. I mean, one, it would have been cost prohibitive yeah. initially, and two, it was like not something anybody had done before. And so to, to think that we could have grown that large and put in all that infrastructure to allow for that to easily happen wasn't really reasonable. So we were forever replacing, rebuilding, upgrading. Um, and I just had my head down. It was like, okay, solve this problem, on to the next problem. Um, and it was that year after year after year of uh, you know, fixing the bottleneck. And, and the one thing that, if you think of Sierra Nevada beer, you think of quality. I think it was, that's the one word that was mm -hmm. hand in hand with Sierra Nevada. Um, talk a little bit about the, I guess, the dedication to quality and what that means for the company. Yeah, so uh, going back to when we first founded the company, we, um, you know, the industry was so small, we knew everybody. So we knew, you know, all the, the brewers, at least smaller brewers in America. And uh, we would get together, at, you know, at a party and Chris Maytag actually at Anchor would throw a party, invite all the industry. And there was, you know, eight of us. Uh, um, so it wasn't <laughs> as if, if there was thousands at the time, but you know, that grew obviously. But um, so one of the things we did see was some brewers were struggling with quality and, and that was really causing their demise. And as I mentioned, you know, the six of us that opened in those first few years, four closed pretty quickly. And um, I would say in, in part, uh, some of them, it was really a quality problem. Uh, they just couldn't make consistent clean beer mm -hmm. batch after batch and their consumers sort of you know, we didn't support them. So we had, uh, I guess, day one, the idea we better be focused on quality and consistency. So we had a lab 
that was um, you know, not sophisticated by today's standards, but it had what we needed. We, you know, we had uh, Zom and Nagel for doing headspace analysis, and we had a, a um, incubator, and we had a plating cabinet, or a laminar flow uh, hood, so we could you know, do sterile plating. Um, so we, we had the, the basic uh, lab equipment we needed. We had an anaerobic uh, incubation uh, system so we could you know, look for anaerobic bacteria. So we, early on, knew we better be focused there so we didn't have bad beer getting in the market. And then as we grew and invested in, in growing the brewery, we uh, continually invested in the, the R&D and the quality control systems. So now we have, well, we have three different laboratories at this brewery and um, you know, one focused just on research and yep. the other one focused on uh, quality parameters and then the other one focused really just on all packaging uh, materials and, and uh, package quality. Uh, so we, we realized that if we didn't get the quality right that we weren't gonna be a, a long-term sustainable company. And in terms of that um, devotion to, to quality, you know, what, how many batches during that time you know, have been dumped or, you know, did you sign off on every batch of pale ale or, or you know, how, did, how do you develop something, I guess, in a, in a small industry where there's, there's no real protocol set, there's no real manuals that you can read? Um, how, how do you put all that in, in place? You, you know, uh, we had the fortune of having UC Davis um, just right down the road from us and they had a brewing program and so okay. they had people with, you know, brewing degrees and getting brewing degrees and uh, per, you know, Professor Michael Lewis and the later Charlie Bamforth, mm -hmm. um, you know, they were a resource certainly that we, we tapped into. Um, but we read everything you could get your hands on uh, in, in the industry and there were a lot of quality focused uh, publications back in, in that era. Um, I mean, many of those groups are, are gone now, but there was Walderstein Laboratories who published communications, uh, Siebel, uh, you know, taught courses, published communications. Um, and so we, you know, read everything we could about beer and beer quality and, and quality control and, uh, you know, what, what you need to do to ensure, you know, from start to finish that you, you paid attention to all the things that, uh, you know, all the details that make a difference. And so we created our own quality manuals and then we had super high standards. And so we dumped and we've dumped plenty of beer that we didn't think for whatever reason mm. um, met our specifications. And, um, and we would rather, um, I guess, take the pain up front rather than have it be a, a long term drag on the, you know, on the brand and the company to have people saying, oh, God, did you, you know, I had a bad Sierra Nevada. Mm -hmm. So we do our darndest to you know, try to stay on top of quality the whole time. Bigfoot, one of those classic beers. Tell us a little bit about it. So, um, we, we did make some pilgrimages to Europe and uh, actually drank um, uh, some barley wines uh, in the UK uh, when they were still, um, I guess, maybe more widely available. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, I guess, generally referred to as what the uh, older ladies would, would sip uh, after dinner um, would be a barley wine. Um, so we were exposed to them, and, and uh, then Fritz uh, actually had, had brewed Old Foghorn, so yep. we um, we had tasted that beer. And uh, again, as home brewers, we brewed everything. And as a homebrew shop owner, um, people would bring in everything. So I got to sample you know, all these different beers that were you know, recreations of, of styles. And so we started working on a barley wine pretty early on. And, um, came out with this beer. We didn't know what to call it, and one of my buddies, uh, um, talked about, you know, it's a big, badass beer. Um, yep. It's a, it's like a Bigfoot. Um, Bigfoot got its name and we've been producing it every year ever since. And does the Bigfoot live in the Sierra Nevada mountains? Um, there's actually one of them in the picture up here, but yes, uh, he is up in the mountains. Um, they, they do hang out. You can occasionally see him if you had enough to drink. <laughs> yeah. Again, this is a, you know, a big punchy beer, high in alcohol, but it's that perfect balance of the alcohol sweetness and the bitterness from the hops mm -hmm. as well. So it's beautiful. Tell us a little bit about exactly where the company is today in 2019. So we built a second brewery in North Carolina a few years back. And, mm -hmm. and so we've got um, you know, two coast production. Um, we're, uh, you know, we're looking at uh, you know, how we uh, make sure we stay relevant with the consumer today. And so we're doing you know, a lot of different styles of beers and we're 
experimenting with things that are on the fringes of beer. Um, we've done, you know, lactic fermentations and we've got a, a barrel program. We've got, uh, you know, I guess, everything you would want as a brewer to be able to play with, we've tried to incorporate because, you know, part of brewing is ha having fun, being creative, mm -hmm. uh, you know, enjoying your craft. And, and so, you know, to, to be able to sort of explore that wide range of what beer has been and what beer can be um, is really what we're focused on. So we're we're always innovating. We have a team that does nothing but uh, innovates around um, you know raw materials, around new styles. Um, so we're we're having fun. We've got a a, a yeast uh, a geneticist here. So we're you know playing with lots of different yeast grains. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a nano brewery, a half barrel brew house. So we have a very small research sure. brewery, and then we've got a, a ten barrel brewery that we do you know, sort of scale up research beers on. And then we've got a 20 barrel brewery in North Carolina where they're always brewing something unique and, and novel. You know, for us, uh, you know, we're always going to try to support our flagship pale ale because it was, yep. was and is such an iconic brand for, mm -hmm. for craft beer. Um, but we also have to be aware that you know, people are, are pretty experimental in their tastes and wants. And, and so we just need to um, focus on, on how we keep delighting uh, people who want to drink beer. And, and one of the, the well, things I remember um, in, in our early days of brewing was in 2007 when we really struggled to get hold of, of any hops. Um, we, we spoke to, to, to you guys and uh, we, we managed to come to an agreement where you sent us, uh, I think, about seven big bales yeah, of hops. And you sent us some barrels. And we sent you some whiskey barrels yeah. from Scotland. So it's like that, that thing of, you know, you. you you're, um, you're one of the leaders of, in the craft beer movement, but it, it, it doesn't matter. You know, you've always got time for the, the little guys, um, and and it's that thing of community, I think, as well, which is which is really great. Well, that's what's made this, I think, such a um, well a fun industry, but also an industry I think that aligns with what a lot of uh, consumers, you know, want to mm -hmm. see from uh, the people who make uh, their products. Is that you know, it's a it's a community that there's. Uh, cooperation rather than there's infighting and and um, you, know, you don't want to have uh, you don't want to think uh, that you know who you buy your um, whether it's produce or, or whatever from is is a, a mean um, um, industry uh, you know cutthroat kind of thing you'd rather have I think uh, you know more like you know rock bands getting along and doing collaborations and playing together and people sitting in and, and um, jamming together. That's, I, I think, part of what makes craft beer what it is today is that you know, there is that kind of get together and have fun. It's a, a, a fun product that adds joy to a lot of people's lives and um, you know, getting together and having fun doing it is important too. You've done a lot giving back to the beer community with, with Beer Camp. Mm -hmm. um, and then also to the wider community, you know, the resilience mm -hmm. IPA at the, the back end of last year when it was the horrible fires. Um, I remember seeing the, the picture of the brewery and then in the yeah, background. Fire right, it, right next to yeah, right, yeah, the right. whole sky was lit up with flames. Yeah. It was terrible. Yeah, um, that was a very tragic situation for, um, for our community. And, uh, you know, the brewery was pretty impacted. We had over 50 employees who've lost their homes. Um, it was like 14% of our Chico workforce lost right. their homes. So, um, you know, it was nothing that, that um, you know, I guess could have been predicted, but when it happened, it was, uh, you know, really, really hard on a lot of people. And so we, we tried to do what we could as uh, being a big community um, member and part of this community. So we opened our doors to anybody who had lost their home to come here and get free meals. We open our gift stores so people get clothing. And that, and that happened at the same time that you were taking the original brewery back to yeah. Chico, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we got my original cobbled together brew house back um, from the folks at Mad River Brewing over uh, in Arcata or over in, in uh, Blue Lake actually, but over on the coast. And uh, we went over and did a road trip, picked all the equipment up and uh, rebuilt it. And we were gonna brew Actually, we're going to brew that uh, original stout recipe mm -hmm. on the, the five barrel system. Um, and the fires happened and we repurposed the kettle to make Thanksgiving for a couple thousand people. And so we opened our, our um, facilities here for big community Thanksgiving. And I boiled, I don't know, almost 2,000 pounds of potatoes in the <laughs> kettle instead of making beer that day. That's phenomenal. Um, yeah. 
Incredible. Cheers to that. So, Ken, thank you for allowing me to understand a little bit more about the story. It's been a phenomenal success over the last almost 40 years. Um, and it's definitely you know, one of the reasons that I got into brewing in the first place. So thank you so much and good luck in the next 40 years too. Well, thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, great having you in Chico and look forward to, to seeing you in North Carolina or out at your brewery as well. I, I plan on coming to visit you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.